Uh, let's bring in Admiral James Stavridis, uh, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, uh, and now an operating executive of our group. Admiral, thanks for taking some time here, a very critical moment uh, in our country. Uh, very curious on your thoughts on the best use uh, of our military right now. Well, first and foremost, uh, the military has to preserve itself, right? I mean, we don't want to have the coronavirus strike the nuclear facilities. We want to make sure our Navy ships can go to sea. But beyond taking care of the 1.2 million active duty people and 800,000 guard and reserves, that's a, a manpower pool of 2 million people. They can do a lot. And you've seen a very vivid example in the last uh, couple of days with the announcements that the two massive hospital ships, Comfort on the East Coast, Mercy on the West Coast, are setting sail uh, on the West Coast. Mercy will pull into Los Angeles shortly, and we'll see the Comfort get to New York City Harbor sometime in the next week. They're coming out of the maintenance availability. Each of those have 1,000 beds, 1,200 medical personnel, uh, they're highly skilled at all of the kinds of work that need to be done. They'll probably be used as auxiliary hospitals. So there are many, many examples. And I would start with medical response. And then you'll see things like Governor Cuomo is doing uh, up in New Rochelle, calling out the guard, the state guard under federal auspices, but working for the governor. They can provide crowd control. They can run testing sites. They can do logistics. They can do water purification, all the above. So quite a bit is the short answer to the question, Brian. Admiral, I know uh, it's Alexis Christophorus here. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that you were an active commander with the Navy during a cholera outbreak about 10 years ago. During that time, we also had the Ebola uh, situation in West Africa. What did you learn sort of being on the front lines of the military during that time? What did you learn then that we could be implementing now during this pandemic? Um, I think three crucial things to bear in mind here. Number one, um, we need to take advantage of the skill sets that the military actually has. Um, in other words, the military is not going to show up with thousands of doctors and nurses, um, but the military can come with logistics, with trucks, with aircraft, with crowd control personnel, with uh, construction units. During the Ebola crisis, we built uh, hospitals very, very quickly. During the cholera outbreak, we did water purification. Um, so there's a, a huge logistic muscle piece of this manpower, as I said, about 2 million folks. So that's number one, tap the military for what the military is actually very good at. Um, number two is uh, don't regard the military as a panacea as follows. At the end of the day, the frontline people here are going to be the civilian medical personnel. I have two son-in-laws who are both physicians, one an emergency room doctor in Atlanta who is truly on the front line. He's seeing COVID-19 patients every single day. That's not the job of the military. The military has to back up those uh, medical personnel. And third and finally, keep this under civilian control. You don't wanna turn this over to the military for command and control. You, you don't want to have to declare martial law. We're nowhere near doing that, nor should we get there. We have to have our civilian leaders like Governor Cuomo in New York, um, the governors all around the country, the president and his team. Um, all of that command and control has to be from the civilian, so we preserve civilian control of the military. So there's three things I would throw out there, Alexis. Admiral, how vulnerable uh, is the U.S. economy? Uh, you look across the country and the U.S. economy is pretty much shut down. I would be I'm most concerned about potential cyber attacks. Uh, you're spot on. And I have written and spoken a bit. I think last time I appeared on your program, and by the way, thank you for having me on. Um, we talked about cyber. It's the number one security threat to the United States. And unfortunately, during a period of time like this, when our large national structures in the world of finance, in the world of business, in the world of medicine, in the world of our actual military are so focused on COVID-19 coronavirus, it's unfortunately a higher possibility that we might see a cyber attack. 
And as you probably know, we've seen a few probing attacks against the Department of Health and Human Services, not against the Department of Defense. So yes, we need to be very concerned about cyber attacks in this period. But let's face it, the virus is all hands on deck at the moment. We're going to need to really keep our focus on that, uh, but not lose the thread of other challenges that are out there for us. And lastly, uh, the economy. A, a way to think about this is um, the virus, of course, threatens the most vulnerable among us demographically, the elderly. But the virus, as it attacks the economy, threatens the most vulnerable among us economically. That's youth, those who are working in the gig industry, uh, people who are often living paycheck to paycheck. So there are two threat vectors out there. And the, the difficult job for the president and the state governors and municipal governors is to find the balance between protecting appropriately the elderly, the demographically vulnerable, but finding a way to maintain an economy that can come back rapidly when we come out of this stand down, this pause, this gap month or two months or four months. That's a delicate balance that our leaders need to find. Admiral, to your point about the economy, we know that President Trump is talking about wanting to get the economy reopened as early as next week. Do you think that is a responsible thing for the president to be doing and talking about? I think the president needs to be listening carefully to our medical professionals. And I look at someone like Dr. Fauci, uh, whom I've known for a decade, have interacted with him in previous crises, um, people like uh, the head of the CDC, including the former head of the CDC, Dr. Tom Friedent, who is another expert in this area. We need to be taking our advice from the medical people on the medical side of this. And once you've done that, then it's perfectly appropriate to listen to the economic side. You've got to be able to do both. But I think that this is a time when we shouldn't uh, operate from our gut instincts, which is what the president has a tendency to do. Sometimes that works for him. Sometimes it works less well. Here, I think we need to base our determinations on science, medicine, certainly taking into account the economics, but that's going to require listening to the experts and following expert advice. That would be my counsel to the president. Admiral, what's the capacity of the U.S. Navy? We have the, uh, the comfort uh, and the mercy being deployed deployed here. How many more ships do you think we will need to have deployed? Um, well, let's uh, let's do the numbers for a second. We have two of these big deck amphibia ships, uh, excuse me, these big hospital ships. Um, each of them have about a thousand bed capacity. But here's the good news. Right behind them, we have what are called big deck amphibious ships. These are ships that are used typically to carry U.S. Marines from port to port. Um, those have a capacity, likewise, of about a thousand beds on each of those. You take the Marines off, you have the sailors drive the ship, poof, you have a floating structure with a thousand beds in it. Um, and those are a capacity that can be brought forward. And we have about a dozen of those, Brian. Um, and then we also ought to look beyond the military in this, look at the cruise line industry. Many of these big, beautiful cruise ships which by the way are all stateroom, unlike these Navy ships, which have large bays, less good when you're trying to do separation. Uh, cruise liners have uh, enormous capacity in terms of staterooms, individual staterooms. So they could come into this, they could be chartered by the government, there are statutes that permit that. And uh, there's a lot of maritime capacity that can come in from the sea and support these hospitals as they face this surge wave we've all been talking about that I think most experts will tell you is coming in the next two to three weeks. Let's get those ships underway. You know, Admiral, uh, for a lot of us, we see our, our healthcare system in this country and it surpasses those from around the world. Some of us don't understand why we just can't seem to get a handle on this pandemic in a quicker way. Is it because our healthcare system is not as well coordinated with, let's say, local and federal governments? What are we missing here? 
Uh, you've got it exactly right. And, you know, there are pluses and minuses to any system of government, right? We have a federal system here where each of the 50 states and the territories um, have their own authorities. They have their own surgeons general. They have their own governors. Um, it's a it's a big, sprawling uh, situation in each of those states has different capacities and frankly, different cultures, different approaches to medicine. So it's very challenging to just on the spur of the moment, get all of that together to face something like a pandemic. So here's the point. Um, rather than bemoaning our lack of organization, what we ought to be thinking about is how do we structure ourselves for the next pandemic? Because frankly, we're lucky with COVID-19 because it has a relatively low mortality rate, you know, somewhere in the one to 3% range, terrible for those who do die, but compared to Spanish influenza hundred years ago, 20% mortality rate compared to avian flu, 60% mortality rate. So um, we've got this pandemic to learn how to get prepared for an even more lethal one that probably will come in the next 20, 50, 100 years. Every 100 years in human history, we see the emergence of a pandemic. Last one 100 years ago, Spanish influenza. So we've got to find ways to create structures that can quickly bring this medical establishment together in better ways. And I'll close by saying the military learned to do this. Um, after World War II, each of the services was very unique, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps. We created a system of joint command and control. You've heard of that chairman of the joint chiefs of staff. We learned how to bring them together. We're going to need to do that, not 100% of the time, not 24-7, but in a way that allows us to respond to the next pandemic. That's going to be crucial. Very helpful insights here. Retired Admiral James Stavridis, former NATO commander, now an operating executive at the Carlar Group. Thank you so much. Thanks for being with me, Brian and Alexis. Hey, investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well, then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.